just a tiny bit of housekeeping that uh, uh, we do at the start, which is to remind you that these sessions are being recorded for research purposes. Um, and that if you don't want to be seen or be heard, you can switch your camera or your microphone off during the sessions that are in this room. Uh, when we go into breakout rooms, they will not be recorded. So when, when we put you in breakout rooms, you can say whatever you like, but we will record whatever conversations or comments or questions that you bring back to the main plenary. So we've got uh, two themes today. Um, the first theme is legal innovations in multi-stakeholder co-ops, which is going to be facilitated by Silvia Sacchetti and Elisabeth Manzari. Um, and then at 3.30, we will start a second theme on uh, funding and incentives for uh, new cooperativism, which will be facilitated by Elisabeth again. Uh, and I think I am second fiddle to Elisabeth in the second half of, of this series. So let me now hand over to Silvia who is going to facilitate the first session. Thank you very much, Roy. And uh, the, the session uh, will start with uh, two statements, uh, uh, one by Ian Adderley and uh, one by uh, our uh, session organizer, Rory Riddleduff. And uh, the first session is on multi-stakeholdership and, um, and the legal innovations that facilitate multi-stakeholder Governance uh, is a theme that um, <clears throat> has been developed, uh, especially in recent years, uh, following the uh, reforms of third sector organizations that, <clears throat> excuse me, have been happening uh, across countries in Europe, in the UK, in France, in Italy, and other countries as well. And uh, it's, a, <clears throat> it's a matter, especially of uh, bringing together internal efficiency and the efficiency of economic systems so that uh, organizations impact on production of public value as well as on uh, private uh, private value. So um, I'll, I'll start with Ian Adderley, uh, who's, um, can I uh, introduce you, Ian? Uh, yes, Ian works, uh, he's, a, he's a lawyer and works as a technical specialist on mutuals and financial conduct authority. And uh, he has been very active in uh, the cooperative movement and uh, providing legal advice around these issues uh, since 2009. And so please, Ian, if you would like to comment a uh, um, couple of minutes, two or three minutes on multi-stakeholdership and, and, and the legal innovations that you've been working on uh, to support this uh, form of business. Thank you. Um, I'll just put, I'm conscious of the, the, the short time as well, but firstly, thank you for the, uh, for, for the invite. It's great to, for these seminars are taking place and uh, it's good to be invited to be part of it on behalf of the, the FCA. I think in terms of what I was going to say, in terms of uh, hopefully provoking some discussion, which was a, the, the steer I was given as well, um, I'll start with saying in the UK, there's no overarching legislative definition of a cooperative, never has been, and there the currently is not, um, albeit there are some restrictions around uses of names. Um, a lot of societies register as co-op societies under the Cooperative and Community Benefit Societies Act, and that's the main the, the main but I'm in, but very cognizant of the fact that other types of legal uh, form are used and other and, and co-ops use other things as well. Um, I, I suppose my point is that I don't particularly see any new legislative innovations in multi-stakeholder co-ops. Um, I, I suppose as to whether there are any legal innovations might depend on one's definition of that. I, I think there's certainly increased exploration of ways in which co-ops are looking to manage a sort of heterogeneous membership. And I think, uh, Rory, in your uh, article, you talked about progress and regress and the, uh, yeah, so the, uh, and I think when we look at the sort of history, I suppose, th there is a long history of co-ops in more than one stakeholder group, more than one membership class. Uh, that goes to a definitional point as to whether that amounts to a multi-stakeholder co-op or not, um, but I'm sure we'll, we'll come on to that. I think the earlier ones, Dr. King's examples, had the greater involvement of workers, consumers, etc. within them, and I think Bert uh, Johnson Birch had talked about the, the, the challenge and the, the, the competing interest has been an internal structural challenge of those cooperatives. Um, 
Andrew Bibby's work on the Hebden Bridge Christian Manufacturing Society had shown that, you know, that they'd looked at multiple classes of membership, dealing with their individual society purchases, the workers, and then, then bringing in uh, investors into that setup. Um, obviously, consumer cooperatives have a long history of involving workers as well um, to different degrees. Sometimes that is in terms of preventing worker control of a consumer cooperative. Sometimes it's about facilitating where that's been under uh, represented. I, I think we, we, we look at some of our larger societies, you know, one of the largest societies has weighted voting, one class with individual members, one class with the societies with weighting between it, that's long standing. And I suppose you look at a lot of secondary co-ops, agricultural co-ops of different voting structures to the traditional one member, one vote, things around weighted voting and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, so I think we've seen more there. I think if we look at now, I think um, Co-op society law leaves a lot to the rules of a society in terms of the, the governance, the, the layer of that, which partly reflects autonomy of cooperatives. Um, there's been multi, uh, model rules for multi-stakeholder co-ops for quite a number of years, over 10 years or so. I think the trend has been increasing. I've used the word complexity or you could use sophistication in terms of looking at ways to manage the different classes of membership and membership groups. Um, but I think the predominant ones are still in multi-stakeholder co-ops with more simple uh, classes and definitions of co-ops. But I think more and more academic thought is being put to solving perhaps some of those earlier structural ch challenges. I'm conscious I'm slightly over, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Yim. And um, can I invite uh, Rory Lidaf now to yep. uh, actually do the same. Rory is, um, uh, so Rory is leading research activity in the Fisher's Institute uh, for Cooperative Social Entrepreneurship is at Sheffield Holland University. And Rory is a specialist in developing tools and educational materials for solidarity cooperatives and multi-stakeholder social enterprises. So please, Rory, you got your three to five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I'll yeah. be quick as well. So things. yes, so I've only got I've got three slides. Um, the first is to draw attention to uh, the Syriac working paper, which we checked during the last seminar, has has been put into practice. This was um, a paper that presented at the ICA research conference that proposed a typology for international reporting, and it included the category of multi-stakeholder co-ops. But interestingly, it aligns very well with the work that we've been doing at, at, at Sheffield Hallam. So that it, it's a situation where there's more than one type of member with significant involvement in the activity, more than one type of member represented in the governance, and critically, from our point of view, that no type of member has a dominant position through a majority of votes uh, or an exclusive veto. Um, and it recognises that multi-stakeholder co-ops can introduce, uh, this is in the paper by Jung, Karini and Bouchard, providers, consumers, workers, volunteers, financiers and or supporters. Now that's, um, it's the first time that I, I've known where the international movement has made a statement on multi-stakeholder co-ops, even though we've known that there have been multi-stakeholder arrangements in specific countries like Croatia and Canada and some of the states of North America and indeed increasingly Italy and France and other places. So in, in the UK we have a particular challenge because of what uh, Ian mentioned that there's no provision to recognise cooperatives properly let alone multi-stakeholder cooperatives. Um, so we've been working on uh, something that can be legally defended. It's not a legal innovation in the sense of passing a law, but it's a legal innovation in the sense of being able to defend a multi-stakeholder co-op against the interest of one dominant group. Before I look at that, though, I just want to say that the, the, one of the most persuasive arguments that I heard or persuaded me to be more confident about multi-stakeholder arrangements was the work of Margaret Lund in, in North America. And she points out that we already have credit unions where people are both savers and borrowers. And, and the supposed tension between being a borrower and a saver isn't isn't a problem. Well, maybe, maybe there's research to show that it is a problem in a, in a co-op, but we've, li we've lived with it for many decades, uh, over a century. We haven't seen that as a conflict of interest. So why do we see being both a producer and a consumer in the same co-op? being a conflict of interest that we can't handle. We think that we can, it can be handled. So for those of you completely new, uh, 
Um, we work with generic labels that people change. So people, uh, we've got people here like Graham Boyd who change these labels in, in the context of a specific enterprise. All of the co-ops we support, we encourage them to recognize founders, labor and users. And in where you can issue share capital in a company or a co-op, you can also have an investor class. Um, our current thinking is that investors who only put in money are non-voting. The other classes are voting. So how do we put that into the Articles of Association? So I've taken this text straight out of the preamble to Articles 39 and 40 in model rules that we put through the FCA with, with Ian brokering and providing feedback. Um, and the reason the FCA wanted us to write this into the rules is that if the rules were ever sent to the regulator, they would want to know that this is what the sponsor of these model rules uh, thought was a reasonable way of implementing the ICA multi-stakeholder advice. So of those groups, no, the, the largest share can go to labour and users. Um, founders always have a very small share. Investors can never, even with founders, have a majority. So the majority control always rests with the producers and consumers, labour users. Yeah. No member class can form a majority on its own. That's in, in, in alignment with the ICA advice. Labour and user members always have combined voting power that is greater than the entrepreneurs and the investors. That's to satisfy, I think, the long-standing cooperative principle of active participation. And importantly, I think founders and members, even combined, can never get a majority. Uh, that's, that's how we write that in. So any regulator who sees these rules passing their desks will know that if somebody's trying to change the uh, resolution. So the last thing I want to say is how can you how, how do we actually protect this? Well, um, Ian and his colleagues gave us feedback that we should create an audit committee that checks resolutions going to the general meeting and it has the power to reject any resolution that tries to take the voting power of a particular class outside of, of these ranges. So that means that members could use the constitution to overturn any, any, any attempt to disenfranchise a stakeholder group and that was our main concern that you can't disenfranchise a stakeholder group. So with that I will uh, stop sharing and open it up to further interviewing with uh, Sylvia. Thank you very much Rory. Yes we have, uh, we're going to a more uh, specific analysis of what you uh, have both uh, emphasized just now and uh, I'll uh, start asking a more specific question to, to both of you. And, uh, and in particular, if you uh, could go a bit deeper on the, um, the, uh, the legal innovations that um, in fact can um, answer the, the challenges that you have highlighted, uh, how to reconcile different interests, how to manage membership uh, in, in the case of, of Ian. Um, so if, if you could address this question first in a few minutes again. Uh, Ian, do you want to start, please? Thank you. I think um, it was useful being reminded of some of the, the, the details of the, the discussion on the on the first shares model as well. And I think because I, I, at the time, the, the, the ICA has produced really helpful guidance back in was it October, September, October 2015 on the principles. Um, it, it, helpful in what it says but then there are aspects where it notes on democratic governance in multi-stakeholder co-ops as a matter for further con future consideration um so then there's a registering authority saying well that's nice but we're considering it now um so, so actually it was quite good reading the ilo publication that, that rory cited earlier looking at pulling that definition from actually the, the where where the ilo the ica the international community has landed on the multi-stakeholder cooperative actually sits with where we'd sort of forerun it um in terms of that and, and for us that was about balancing the interests of different groups of members and not allowing one group to have dominance that th that's not an unusual concept in the sense that even in company law you've got uh, minority protection rights not not the same and it's not seeking to say the same thing but you're know, avoiding the tyranny of the majority and that, and that sort of thing but how do you balance those rights and interests together we've we've long looked at things around um say well actually if co-ops need to have investor members uh, to capitalise the cooperative, if, um, and, and that is long standing, that goes back to the 19th century, um, if they need to have investor members, 
in what way can that be facilitated without impacting the integrity of the society? And, and the legal innovation there from a UK perspective was the European Co-op Society work um, uh, from the EU, where we said, well, if it's possible to be registered in the UK with 25% of your members as investor, non-user investor members, to use the exact phrase, if it's possible to register in the UK through EU legislation, uh, through EU directive and regulation, from a parity perspective, it must be possible for there to be a co-op in the UK with 20, up to 25% investor members. We've since evolved that and uh, moved to a more principles-based guidance rather than specific figures, but we say it shouldn't compromise control. When you take principles like that into a multi-stakeholder co and say, well, what are the different interests between people and, and how, are those best, how are those best balanced? I think the credit union example is interesting. I think some of the credit union stuff's been enforced in that they've got ratios um, between borrowing and uh, yeah, between lending and, and borrowing um, and, and they've got to achieve that for basic profitability. Um, I, I think in the financial cocktails you've got a lot more of an overlap of the membership so often the members are both savers and borrowers so it's less of a it's less of a heterogeneous membership than it might suggest because a lot of those are the same people at different points in time. Um, so they, they have that same interest. I, I think really for me that what's what's developed is not so much the, the legal innovations, but I think the academic rigour and thought to these particular questions around multi-stakeholder governance, there's been a lot more that's emerged, even noting that the ICA in 2015 was describing it as a matter for future consideration, seeing what's emerged on the statistical classification. I think a lot more, I think there's been an international recognition of the, of the long-standing existence and the need to classify. And then there's been a lot of thought put into the managing of those potential tensions which exist in any co-op um, uh, and those potential competing interests. Um, uh, and there's been a lot more thought to thinking how that does. I think in the UK, what you've found is a very flexible legal framework because of the lack of specificity. I think in other countries like in Italy, in France, in, in, in the civil law traditions where you have specificity in saying you're one of these five types of co-op in France, you either a worker co-op or you're a secondary co-op, then you've needed the legal recognition because you can only register under specific pieces of legislation. UK has had a very different legal tradition um, and that's allowed... Uh, much in the same way that in 2005, six, whatever community shares became, mm. I think, saying, well, what, what's this new legal innovation that's driven community shares? 19th century legislation. Um, mm. You know, there wasn't a particular legal innovation, but it's people looking at it and putting that collective effort to it to make sure that the underlying substratum of the integrity of the co-op isn't undermined. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. In, indeed, Italy has uh, introduced a reform for third sector organizations in 2017, where multi stakeholdership is central. And, uh, and that works especially for social cooperatives, mm -hmm. where the interest of users and workers uh, uh, overlap, essentially. Um, in, okay. in a way, uh, they're complementary. There would be no social cooperatives or work integration cooperatives if the workers didn't do the interests of the users uh, and, and vice versa. Uh, and, and the, the examples in Italy actually prompted it. There was a Principles of European Co-op Legislation Working Group and uh, Anthony Fici is, was doing a lot of work chairing that and the, the Italian examples and what Italy was doing provoked most debate and most conversation. Uh, because actually one of the things that group tried to introduce in an earlier draft but rode back from was the concept of a general interest co-op. And actually that got a lot of pushback at an EU level and a lot of pushback in the legal scholarship. Um, uh, but some of that was drawn from some of the Italian examples as well. So there's, yes. there's some quite interesting examples when you compare in different countries about how things are, are emerging. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Ian yeah. and Rory. There was interesting precedent just building on what Ian has said, I mean, we, uh, my first visit to Mondragon and reinforced recently, you know, you find we talk about them as worker co-ops, but actually people who've been a member and left and only have a, a capital contribution left, they get 20 percent of the voting power. So there is there are examples within the cooperative movement of of uh, members having a capital investment and having voting rights. Um, and the same, I think, is true in France, where I think is up to a third. I think in, when I, at the time I was doing my PhD, it was a third of the governance and a third of the, the voting power in the General Assembly could, could be in non-participating members. 
but the the European work sort of recommended a cap of 25%. And I think I can see why that is the case because 75% is often the threshold. But the the ICA work, um, it's it. It, it's it's about I mean if, if for example um, Fair BNB have come up um, Fair BNB had seventy percent worker thirty percent investors but that's still regarded as a worker co-op both by Fair BNB and by the ICA um, it, f- for us uh, multi stakeholding doesn't really begin until you have to cooperate with the other member classes it's about balancing interests not just individual uh, member voting power that you you can't have a class that can outvote another class um, or that the classes have to collaborate and cooperate and talk to each other in order to facilitate a, a majority view about how to go forward and of course people might say they stagnate but there can be equal damage done to a, to a venture by one group oppressing another group within within the enterprise and that's that's the the upside of, of uh, developing a sophisticated approach to multi-stakeholder co-ops. Um, the other, I'm just conscious that we need to go into breakout rooms shortly. Um, the other point that occurred to me while we were talking is we talked about savers and borrowers and that, you know, there could be conflicts and you need to manage it. But there are, I think it linked to the, the, the trends in new cooperativism towards digital platforms and things. There are many more contexts now in which we are both producers and consumers. And that is why we need to recognize our role as a producer on a digital platform, as well as a user of, of a digital platform. We do both concurrently all the time in many digital contexts. And, and uh, Graham will, I think, attest to this that in the digital space it makes a great deal of sense to adopt a multi-stakeholder or a solidarity structure. Um, and you you can, you know, the, the concept of a prosumer member um, is active within the work that we've been doing um, with people working in, in digital entrepreneurship. So I'll, I'll leave it there um, and then uh, I'll facilitate the breakout rooms. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rory. Yes, we go into discussion in groups now. Is that right, Rory? That is right. So, um, just want to give you twenty. I'll set up the breakout rooms. So, uh, you should get your invitation now. Okay. So, what what do we think? What um, I was uh, I was um, uh, quite curious actually to. Uh, go a bit deeper on the last point you made about platforms. Uh, my mm. my feeling is that um, cooperation and organizations where the, the co- cooperative approach, at least, uh, not uh, necessarily the cooperative business form, but the, the deep cooperative approach uh, has been sort of um, appropriated by but some platforms like uh, you know like uh, you were mentioning uh, Airbnb or or other platforms and in a way that idea of cooperation is is becoming something else which is perhaps a more superficial level as you were. um I've mentioned fair b and b rather than fair, Airbnb. Oh, okay sorry yeah. I, I was but, a, a little um, bit confused by Airbnb. but yeah um, uh, anyways you know that sort of Airbnb or other platforms like that yeah it's it's, uh, it's interesting because appropriate, appropriate that idea of being uh, sort of uh, cooperative platforms uh, but uh, it's a very different idea of cooperation and, and no there's a there's work by Trebor Schultz uh, Schultz um, in the platform co-op consortium. He he regards sort of Airbnb and Uber as extractive capitalist platforms rather than cooperative platforms. Um, but I, I've heard you know even experienced experienced cooperators um, speaking in defence of of the originating principles of Airbnb and. Um, that you know it can it, it points it points in a direction where you can have uh, mutual models that operate through te- technology exchange and I mean the culture that is created around Airbnb of, of people hosting you in a much more personal way um, than ever happens when you're a, you know the corporate way like you get in a hotel it's very different I mean it was, certainly was very different when I first used it 
but I don't think more and more corporations are listing their accommodation on Airbnb, and then it then it becomes more corporatized again. Um, you, you've got that trend with a lot of online stuff. Like if you look at the early eBay, early eBay was yes. mainly people selling their own things to other people. Now yeah. it's largely companies selling things through eBay, and yeah. a, a very small percentage is actually I'm selling my stuff. To, yeah, yeah, certainly competitive. So, and you've got that the evolution of if it becomes a people are going to and i suppose you, you'll have similar things with airbnb yeah um, things like uber are slightly more controlled because it's not a sort of mm-hmm. yeah it's, a, it's more of a gateway to uh to services for both drivers for passengers and passengers for drivers but um yeah um i mean it's uh... Both, I think both Uber and Airbnb have talked about enfranchising their their drivers and their customers, but I don't know to what extent. Um, probably only a marginal extent. But Fair B and B is a work co-op, but they want to be a multi-stakeholder co-op. So both Graham and I have had conversations. I don't know if anybody else here has. They they have a, what they call ambass- ambassadors, and we we discussed. I think I mentioned this in the first seminar. So we talked about forming either a co-op of ambassadors that could then uh, form a a secondary co-op where you've got the workers and the ambassadors with equal power within a secondary structure. Or they create a government structure that includes their ambassadors and their hosts and their guests. So they have a proper role in governance. of course, they've gone down a particular path now, so they, they need to evolve from the path they'd started on. Um, the, go on. The, 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 the interesting concept for me is more the kind of, it's almost the kind of concept of a sort of customer buyout in the sense of the, the, the huge amount of capital required to start Airbnb, huge amounts of capital investment yeah. that you, you, you're simply not going to get people investing that in a startup at, at that level of risk, given the number of those ventures that fail. Um, in terms of, whereas once you've built up the customer base of either people who are customers in the sense of they're, they're using the platform to rent out their property or they're customers in the sense of they're renting out a property from someone. Um, they're both customers of Airbnb, albeit they've got a different relationship to each other. Um, once you've built up that mass space, you've then got the thing that actually a lot of these people might then be more interested in going, well, this would work really well as a, as a cooperative. And, but you've also, you know, it's, you know, is there an equivalent to sort of the employee buyout in terms of the customer buyout and going, is there a way to then democratize the structure because the owners aren't going to do that unless they're benevolent or philanthropic. Um, but is there, is there something, to, something around there? Uh, and I suppose the challenge is, is it, is it worth it in terms of the, the cost that it might involve? Because if, if the fees are kept low enough, uh, people might decide it's not worth taking on the risk. It is uh, perhaps also a matter of uh, creating, I mean, on the one hand, we have the legal structure on the other hand, uh, we need the processes uh, that support uh, uh, cooperation and multi-stakeholder issue, which means that, uh, at least in my experience, there needs to be an operational level uh, besides the structure that uh, supports uh, uh, decision making that is deliberative and participated, mm. and 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 that happens at organizational level. It's a specific competence that organizations need to develop, and 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 in fact, it seems quite difficult to achieve. Uh, well, it, it it is quite difficult to achieve, but not impossible, of course, in organizations, but. It, it could be even more difficult for for platforms if you know a, a genuine deliberative process of of you know sharing ideas and and deliberate together uh, mm. you know, at least because of the limitations of of the technology um, I think so technology is going to get better Steve Elizabeth don't, don't feel I mean do contribute this is a this is a breakout uh, not a I'm enjoying listening <laughs> I'm enjoying listening to um the, um, I mean, the governance question I think is interesting because we 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 realised quite early in 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 my own PhD study that you need to think separately about the multi-stakeholder arrangements in 
ownership, in governance, and in management. So you could have multi-stakeholder governance, but you don't have multi-stakeholder management. Or you could have multi-stakeholder ownership, which is ported into the governance system or is not ported into the governance system. It, 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 it's, they are separate decisions in different domains. And, and while I've been, I suppose my work is, trying, is oriented towards integrating it into all three, um, I think you can see that, uh, I mean, one of the things about Graham Boyd is I think he integrates it in some in some places, but not in others. But then he's also big on sociocracy. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a strange paradox of, um, it's, it's a paradox of a participatory philosophy that nevertheless does actually entrench some powers amongst what he calls stewards. So he has a, a stewardship group. The stewardship group have an obligation, almost like trustees of a charity, to look to the future and stuff like that. So I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure it would meet the ICA uh, definition. Uh, nevertheless, he's using the latest model rules, which do go all the way towards that ICA definition. So we'll see where it goes. Could I add it, something? Yeah. Rory? Yeah. Sorry. Is that is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a, a slight tangent, but I think it's relevant to this particular discussion. So um, Ian especially be aware of the legislation around DOTs in the UK. Um, now, I'm currently in Malta at the moment, heading back to the UK tomorrow, but um, I was in discussions with the economy minister here in Malta and suggesting that they should review something similar. And, and what I meant by that is this concept of allowing um, business owners to sell to their employees. Um, and the reason that I've been using that terminology at the moment is because uh, Malta has a very, very clear, clearly defined cooperative law. Um, you cannot use the name cooperative unless you're formed under that cooperative law and it has its own tax structures. But there is no mechanism yet um, to allow existing private limited company businesses to convert to that kind of status, um, member owned, let's call it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's quite an interesting point, uh, and we were looking at the other option of, of effectively customer owned as well, um, and then turning that into multi-stakeholder angles. So I think the legal point that Ian made in his presentation there is, is, is really important because across the world we have so many different legislative points, um, but ultimately if we want to grow the cooperative economy, uh, I do think we need to allow for the conversion, not just creating new co-ops, but conversion of existing businesses into cooperatives. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and interesting, in, in the UK, there are more companies converting to co-ops than there are co-ops converting to companies year on year. That's good. Mm -hmm. There are more coming into the society form than going out through conversion. And uh, which... What, what, what do you think is, is the cause for that? Is the legal framework that is clearer now uh, or a change of uh, perspective perhaps on business? I, th I think there are two distinct parts of it. I think one aspect of the conversions is the large retail societies with lots of subsidiaries that acquire companies and want to bring them into the society structure and make them subsidiaries and they'd rather have them as societies than companies because it's a lot easier to have everything under the same legal framework and you can facilitate transfers of engagement to consolidate it back all into the parent so some of it is a mechanism to bring a purchased private entity into cooperative ownership convert it to a society transfer its engagements into a uh, into another society um, to consolidate the other aspect of it um, is where people are looking to broaden membership and fundraise in particular as well um, so if they're looking to raise capital from people in the UK private limited companies can't do public offerings of shares um, legally uh, whereas societies can um, can more cheaply can do it f uh, in the sense of a, co a private limited company cannot issue shares to the public it can only issue shares to connected persons um, a right. public limited company can issue shares to the, to, the, to the public but a private limited company can only do to connected persons in practice that often means they create a mailing list or an interest group with people that say they 
and then they say the connected. So, so people are getting not around it, but they're finding a way to make people connected. Whereas there's nothing preventing a society just saying, "Come and join us, and you can subscribe more share capital than the minimum if you want to." And these are the risks, and this is what we're what we're looking to achieve. I've just um, got the, told the groups they've got 15 minutes left. By the way, but yeah, but I think you've got those two. So some of it, as I say, is functional. Some of it is looking at ways to maximize participation of broader membership bases to which a lot of people wouldn't see the company structure as as well suited to particularly because the company structure will default to one share one vote um unless you do a lot of unpicking of it you can unpick it but yeah it's it's uh, most and is what i think most companies that are set up in the uk certainly a large number are just using model articles which will be one share one vote or you just purchase a shell company that's already there and rename it because then you can have a company instantly um mm -hmm. so a lot of the time and a lot of the business advice just stirs people towards companies because that's what the business advisors know and then they get a different business advisor or a co-op advisor going why are you a company why aren't you this and then they go okay we can convert and yeah. so some of it's the sort of latency of the advice just to put something else in the discussion, what was quite interesting on the on to bring it back to the new cooperativism stuff, I actually think there's a there's a tension between the ICA ILO statistics classification and new cooperativism. So, so the ILO statistics say that mutual societies, self help groups, or social ventures should not be counted as cooperatives, and they also say that a cooperative should be formally established uh, institutional unit. Whereas obviously when you look at the new cooperativism definitions, it does not necessarily need to be formally constituted, uh, yeah. et cetera. So, so I think the, the, the ILO ICA stuff is more, it takes should, a much narrower approach. Than it the does new take a narrow approach, but I think the, the, the interest that, you know, I think I'm speaking for Marcelo um, and echoing back to our own history, you know, um, and the history, like you know, the, the, the primary co-op at Mondragon was unincorporated for five years before it had 40, I think it had it started with 40 staff um, and grew and then only later did they incorporate. Ian, can I ask just on the, the point there about shares, um, is that exclusively withdrawable shares or is there any discussion around transferable? So, so I suppose there's two aspects to it. The... The, the prohibition on issuing shares to the public exists in company law. Um, I can't which section, one of them. Um, it's only 600 pages to look through. Uh, the society law doesn't contain any prohibition. What you've then got separately are the laws and regulations around the marketing of and advertising of those shares. And that's where the financial promotions rules and prospectus rules kick in, which are largely agnostic of legal entity apart from when it comes to specificity but our principles basis it's saying if you want to do this you, you you've got to have a approved prospectus or whatever else unless you're in an exemption the exemption goes to things like non-readily realizable investment and that's where it goes to the withdrawable shares and that's where the transferable ones are caught um so, so a, it's different for community benefit societies as well. The prospectus rule disapplications are much broader for community benefit societies than there are cooperatives. Um, but for cooperatives, it's only the withdrawable, non-transferable share capital. I make that point because withdrawable and transferable are not mutually exclusive. Um, people often talk about those alternates, but you can have share capital that's withdrawable and transferable um, or withdrawable and non-exit. You can any combination of those two two things. Mm -hmm. the, the transferable share capital is caught by the financial promotions rules which then increase your mm. compliance costs in terms of if you want to offer them um but then there's a broader question and i know it's one you're interested in on on the transferable shares i think i think nearly all if not all legislation well most countries certainly these this ones that have been analyzed in the international handbook on co-op law and everything most countries co-op laws place restrictions on the transferability of shares yeah um, and actually in the UK up until the late 19th century, to, uh, the transfer of a share was not just a board decision, but also a decision by the General Assembly, by, the, by a general meeting to allow the transfer of a share. Mm -hmm. It was, a, I think, an 1893 streamlining measure to say it could just be the board that could agree to consent to a transfer. But because mm -hmm. the shares are generally denoting ownership, uh, yeah, the, the freely transferable bit uh, becomes problematic 
I, I, I suppose the challenge is if you compartmentalize that so you can have extra shares on top of the member share that's traded transferable you're then having to introduce some sort of market into the transfer of those shares um which then obviously presents a, a, a challenge depending on how well that's controlled. It's, it's, but that's what we're looking into. The principle of, of non non voting will will be accepted, I think. Um, I mean, Stephen, Steve and I have had these conversations in in South America, did we not? Around um, to what extent is it good to have large numbers of non non-participating members in a co-op and i mean for, St for steve his argument is we're never going to have cooperative platforms to compete with you know facebook and google and, and the others unless the co-op movement has a way of generating mass support for an alternative platform um but the, pr the price of that is is sharing sharing the economic benefits without sharing the governance rights um I still think you know if you can reach a, if you can reach a size where word of mouth can scale a cooperative project, um, we might be surprised. I mean, think of smart co-op um, that's uh, spreading across Europe, and, and Fair B and B I think has got recognition in many country contexts, um, and they're sort of basically operating on their idea is that you have a local ambassador who controls the local market, you know, or who, sorry, facilitates access to the local market, should I say. So they, they tailor and customize the platform for a regional economy. Um, it's not a subsidiary. It's a, it's a particular type of member who's, who's organizing the operational effort. Yeah. You've got you've got something not too dissimilar in a lot of uh, you used to have it in the UK less so now but if you look at a lot of the cocoa cooperatives and other uh, and other things you you have the 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 one person in each area who is elected to essentially police weights and measures and fair payment of stuff and yeah you know, the, the 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 person with a lot of trust is put into to make sure that the the beans are being correctly weighed or the grains being correctly weighed and that members aren't mm -hmm. being done over and i mean some of that will reflect the lack of systemization in some places of it but you, you also had that much earlier in the the the, the consumer co-ops in the uk in the, the 19th century about who, whose role is it to check and to log and to monitor that and that's in you, you know when you look at eleanor ostrom's work as well but the things that are required for you know, the, the, yeah. the, the, the 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 small p policing the escalating sanctions the enforceability the registering of some rules that you refer back to there's a lot of the core things there um and i think more exploration because you've got a new and emerging commons really haven't you in terms of certainly with digital uh, in that some things are just being created that at different points in time either people don't own or people own benevolently and benignly um but does that become a commons and then if so how is it how do we choose to manage it and, and what we i suppose what you what history has shown us is that commons can be eroded through actions of state actors and others um, and actually leaving a commons unincorporated means there's no enforceable legal right, um, which also means you can't prevent someone taking into words if you create a legal right. Um, and that's, I think, a debate I remember having at Co-op Studies Conference years ago around uh, open source software and that sort of thing. I said, well, we don't want to do it. Well, that's mm -hmm. fine. But if someone steals it or and it's not yours, it's not someone's, how are you going to enforce that right or what are you going to do or how are you going to so but that presents a conceptual and theoretical challenge to the nature yeah. of it as well i've just given them a, their five minute warning yeah that's a very interesting point Ian, because it, it, it really connects back to uh inst well, early institutionalists and and john commons for example for whom uh institutions are both uh, uh, constraining and enabling uh, and of mm. course if you want to enable cooperation you also need to ensure that other people do not behave opportunistically otherwise you 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 make cooperators uh, sort of run away from 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 the game and that's uh, that's i think uh, an important point to to keep I in mind introduce another sort of legal 
um, area. Uh, something that Steve has raised with me, with his um, with his colleagues. I mean, we, we've we've had legal innovations that enable um, tax incentives for the creation of employee-owned businesses, and and um, I, I that they, these tax incentives, I believe. I mean, we certainly use them in the worker co-op that I was in, um, but they're they're designed really, I think, to facilitate transfer of ownership from from um, own, outgoing owners to the workforce. And there are tax breaks for the recipient employees who become employee owners, and there are tax breaks for the outgoing entrepreneurs who are uh, putting their business into mutual ownership. But we've we've talked about the the the, the fact that you can't get similar tax breaks for the conversion of a consumer owned business. Um, Cause anybody who comes into, cause if you're not converting to a majority worker owned business, you can't access the tax benefits that have been created to facilitate that. Um, and there are no tax benefits uh, to enable you to convert to, you know, consumer or user ownership. So we thought that, there should be a, a, a legal argument or we wanted to put together a legal argument that any conversion to a cooperative, um, if, if, if the members are acquiring shares in a new cooperative venture, they shouldn't have to pay any tax until those shares are sold as opposed to when they're acquired. At the moment, you create the tax liability on the acquisition of those shares, not on the sale of those shares. Uh, which is strange because if you think of other investors, they buy shares in, a, in an enterprise, and they don't have any tax liability until they share, until they sell them. Is that true of conversions? Um, there are tax breaks for the outgoing entrepreneurs when they sell their shares to the workforce, providing it goes into majority employee ownership, but not if it goes into majority consumer and employee ownership. If that makes sense. Um, or majority consumer ownership. I'm not sure about majority consumer ownership. It might be if it's classed as a charity, I suppose, you might get a tax break or if is it's recognised. It, is, it, is this when the shares are sold in the company or if post-conversion the shares are withdrawn from a society? I think, Rory, are you, conf are you talking about the difference in, between the market value of those shares versus what's been paid by the, the, the workers? And Well, no, because the, the liability... Um, the liability is in whatever value HMRC put on the shares, isn't it? So if I acquire a, a twenty thousand pound holding in a in a in a uh, my own company, I would be expected to pay tax on that as in, as, as if it were income. But if you if you're paying twenty thousand for those shares, you, you won't be paying you won't be taxed on that purchase. Yes, we were when 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 we. When we set up our um, spin out from a worker co-op and people actually bought, they had to buy, some, part, some of their salary went towards getting their shareholding, they were taxed. They had to pay national insurance on um, that part of their salary that was going towards buying shares. Um, I, I, I just wanted to introduce that in. It's, we, we've talked about legal innovations for multi-stakeholder co-ops purely in terms of constitutions and not in terms of um, how you incentivize different stakeholders to participate in a multi-stakeholder enterprise and the barriers to different stakeholders participating in a multi-stakeholder enterprise. So I can put it on the table, but we haven't got a solution yet. I'd see it sitting in the arena of tax policy rather than legal innovation in a sense of if... Well, it's tax if, law, isn't it? Yeah, but in a sense of it's a policy question really in terms of does, does a government want to through the tax scheme incentivize or disincentivize or tax or not tax that particular type of um t particular type of transaction which i suppose yeah would be codified in a tax act of some some sort at some point but depending on might depend on the scale of the change as well because some of it might just be uh, and I, I, I can't comment definitively some of it might just right. be rules within hmrc for instance rather than particular points of legislation but uh, that's something you'd have to okay. look into um, in more detail. We're just closing the rooms now, so people will be joining us again. Right, so it's, it's back to you, Sylvia.
So panellists, we, we, we keep quiet now. We get our time at the end. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rory. So it's time for feedback from, uh, from the groups. And uh, if you had a chance to actually uh, summarize or think about uh, one or two questions that you would like to ask Ian and Rory, um, we, we can do that now um, and, and start a discussion. <clears throat> We didn't really prepare a question, to be honest. We just shared a little bit the experience from because we had um, UK and Canadian <laughs> participants. So Excellent. we talked a little bit about what different people are, are interested in. Um, Rory, perhaps one thing that um, maybe Trey can say more about it. She mentioned that in Alberta, there's a discussion on it's called um, Opportunity Development Cooperatives as investment cooperatives for um, rural area. So that was one topic that came up, and that was very interesting. Um, but as I said, we did. Do share what you talked about. Give us details, otherwise we won't know. <laughs> uh, sure, I can share a little bit. Um, so there's there's been a lot of questions here in the province of Alberta, particularly with the decline of the oil and gas sector and then COVID on top of it and everything else. Um, particularly the rural areas of Alberta have been very strongly hit. Um, but in the last 10 years or so, there's been an, a new form that the Cooperatives Association put a great deal of money into, like we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars to set up both financially and legally a structure that they're now calling an opportunity development cooperative, which is a form of investment cooperative. Um, and of course that's got its own, uh, <laughs> its own challenges. Um, the, 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 the illustration that I gave that sort of was the flagship trial uh, pilot was a very tiny town that had a butcher shop in it. And that butcher shop was the key butcher shop for multiple um, ranchers in the area. And this butcher was entering his 70s, 80s in terms of age and needed to stop working and needed to retire. If that butcher shop had stopped operating, it would have had an impact on the entire ecosystem in a way that was absolutely cost prohibitive. So what wound up happening was the town or who was left in the town uh, bonded together and became investors in the business and took over the business and then entered into a succession plan where they actually brought in two families into the community that now jointly run the butcher shop to keep that ecosystem thriving and to keep it active. And they have now since, I believe, invested in two other businesses and now the community is thriving again. So there is this real, and it doesn't have to be rural, but in this case, the example was rural. And so there was this conversation that, that percolated, and, and I'll pass it on to Darren as well, just to give you a heads up, Darren, um, because Darren has been investigating capitalism and platforms in light of cooperatives. And, and part of where we feel there is a real perhaps call it a precipitation point um, that is starting to emerge is, is the, the dialogue that is shifting conversations of finance away from extractive uh, profit growth oriented principles more into stewardship. And that there is a real opportunity here to start taking these kinds of experiments of what we mean by stewardship, what we mean by investment, what we mean by cooperativism and weaving that in with shifts that need to change in the realm of capitalism and finance. So that's where we were going as a group. And, and with that, I'd like to pass it on to Darren because Darren had been, was in the midst of saying some beautiful things and then I got bumped out of the group. So 
<laughs> so Darren, I would really like to just hear a little bit more about that. And if there's anything further you would like to add. Um, Trey, I wasn't expecting that. Um, the, um, rather than, I, I'll just start with the, one of the things that's worked, Gillian, the point made about, or well, we were talking about the barriers, uh, uh, legal barriers uh, to setting up and to, 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 to growth uh, with uh, cooperatives. And uh, Gillian was pointing out that not, not least the barrier about cost about, and complexity with setting up cooperatives. So there was, we had discussions around the, the, uh, uh, the, the barriers that, li the bar legal barriers that uh, pro prohibit uh, uh, setting up, but also growing uh, cooperatives. And then tying that in with what Trey was saying with the, um, the point about uh, um, the with the Canadian uh, ODC example was that um, things are okay as long as the uh, um, the, the development is positive and things are going well. But when things go wrong, then inevitably the legal issues become more important and more of a of a, a, a factor. Um, as far as specifically my research, um, try ask a particular question about stewardship which I didn't answer in any shape or form um, when I started rambling about my research. But there was um, one of the things I'm finding is that um, as far as stewardship is concerned, is that uh, um, so my research is around uh, people that are actually making money um, from uh, education videos on platforms. And as far as stewardship is concerned and stakeholders and legal issues, there's really a, a disconnect between producers and the running of the platforms. There is actually a, 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 almost a, a conscious um, decision or by evidence that many of the platforms are keeping the producers arm's length and aren't involved in any of the, whether it's the foundation or the development of the, uh, the platforms themselves. So the, the word that's uh, always reminds me of the word pedagogy, which no one quite knows how to say and hegemony is there's a real disconnect between the language that the platforms are using and the language that the the uh, the producers uh, are using and there's a, often a sense of uh, no in involvement in terms and conditions would be a good example so often the producer would say uh, the terms and conditions have changed i had no idea that they were going to change and my income has halved uh, overnight uh, i've had no uh, communication so it's all very uh, uh, retrospective in, in 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 many senses and um, so there's, uh, um, I think it's an important point that, um, or the opportunity, let's say, for the world of social enterprise and property movement, that where people do want to get involved. These producers do want, are interested in how platforms are run. They are interested about the other side of the line, what the platform, despite what the platforms may think, but often it's in their interest uh, to, to, to not make that happen. And I think that would be an, an opportunity for the property movement or social enterprise moving forward to, to properly engage uh, any new platform um, that uh, establishes itself to inv involve the uh, the uh, stakeholders, all of the stakeholders in that that uh, development, whether it's legal or otherwise. Thank you. Do do, do you want to comment, uh, Ian or Rory, on? Uh... I'm happy to just wait till. To, to yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we, we, we can ask group two. Uh, so now group to... two was. Uh, Graham was in there uh, yeah. and uh, contributed a lot. So it's unfortunate he's uh, had to jump off to another meeting. But but there we go. Um, Repeat what he said anyway. <laughs> that would take too long. <laughs> um, but uh, and he was talking a lot about his own work around companies and how that has intersected with the work that you've been doing, Rory, and others around fair shares and, and so on. And the extent to which you can actually use existing company law to involve different stakeholder groups. Uh, and so on. one question I had to Graham, which I think also have to you, is that... Um, in the multi-stakeholder structure with investors, although their uh, influence is in governance is limited, uh, as we all know, investors have other influences, um, the power of finance capital, uh, and therefore can potentially exercise that through uh, 
demanding preferential return on capital uh, as in terms of any distributions, et cetera, et cetera. So um, Graham had a sort of response to that in terms of the company structure, but it seems to me a, a question that I would like Rory or somebody else involved in the fair shares uh, m model development to respond to, because it seems to me that that's potentially a weakness that needs to be addressed in one way or another. Um, the other thing that came out, I suppose, for me, came out of the discussion that we had, particularly with, with Graham, was that you can incorporate different stakeholders by having more than one company or cooperative structure. He called it a constellation of, uh, of companies that may be a bit kind of ambitious in terms of what a constellation normally consists of, but, but that you can, you can use different companies or cooperatives can come together uh, as this kind of constellation to uh, create a central um, support mechanism or whatever it might be. So those are the two things that came out of it for me. I don't know if Mary or Dennis um, Junkai said he was there as a student just to listen, so and that was fine. Um, but I don't know if Mary or Dennis has anything else to add from what we discussed. Well, I think you've done a really good job of articulating and um, uh, 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 explaining the discussion because it was quite interesting in terms of uh, the whole issue of multi-stakeholder. We we also talked about maybe experiences of multi-stakeholder cooperatives or other types of organizational forms um, that we that we have direct experience of. And I suppose suffice to say it's quite limited. Um, so it was good to um, hear some of the um, the views and the visions that, that Graeme was also articulating on and, and the experiences shared by people. Yeah, and there was another point um, in, and there was a question of mine uh, in what way um, the, the current legal structures are an obstacle and, 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 uh, and the, the, the governance models that are thought of right now are more a way of circumventing these legal structures, whereas you m might be able to bypass them if you go, uh, for example, to smart contracts on blockchain or algorithms or anything like that. But we never got to that point of that uh, latter part. Um, so that's maybe something we could discuss here. In what way you can just escape all these, these circumventions legally just by going on to the blockchain and, and create your ideal world if, if that's in, uh, at all possible. Anything else? If we've had a round, that maybe Ian and I could do an interim feedback. We've got about um, comfortably fifteen minutes uh, to for the still to go. Shall I shall I start responding, Ian, and then you follow on? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I was I was interested in the opportunity develop co develop, development co-ops that um, Trey's talking about. It reminds me of some of the discussions I heard in Indonesia, but they were they were easily corrupted. Um, they did become ways for you know wealthy people to you know, put their money together and not actually give membership to others. But it sounds to me like this is very different. Um, and it's it, there were examples in China of lots of villages coming together to collectively control land and prevent the state from grabbing it from the village. Sort of in the, um, um, the particular paper, there was a whole special issue on on uh, what was going on in Asia where that was covered. Um, I was wondering if they cre if they create multi 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 stakeholder structures when they create the co op with the families. Um, is it sort of following the French social economy model where a co-op can invest, but it must then exit within seven years and leave membership in control of those who are actively participating in the enterprise? So it'd be interesting to see what policies there are for the long term development of a cooperative culture. Um, I'd be happy to hear from you on that. On um, the question 
that Martin put to us about investor influence. Um, it's a very it's a very vexed question, um, and I think you're right. As soon as a as soon as a company is indebted to a group of people, and they have legal instruments that they could use to call in their debts, then uh, you do have you're in a vulnerable position. And we we've seen this repeatedly, haven't we? You know, particularly in the UK, um, which is why I think asking people to put in risk capital might be some protection against that. Um, the question of whether they get a voice or not has has been debated hotly, certainly within the Fair Shares Association over the last seven, eight years. Um, I initially wasn't keen that I was keen for them to have a voice without voting power, if that makes sense. So that they had a right to attend meetings and speak. But gradually, I was persuaded that maybe they do need some some voting power, but I think with working with Steve Gill on co-op exchange and the conversion of VMA co-op and the different co-op bodies, this is a very sensitive issue. Um, and yet I still look to the international examples where there is voting power in the hands of, of people. So I think we need to look at how it's been defended in places like France, in Italy and Spain, how do they how do they address the questions of limiting investor influence or the, the the position that we've been taking and whether this is is viable is i think is something that we need to work out is that somebody who has been actively participating um and, and then withdraws from active participation but leaves their capital in that they should continue to have a voice but somebody who's only put money in in order to make money doesn't have a voice and that's where we're drawing the boundary in, in the work with Steve at the moment. Um, I don't know if that fully answers your question. Uh, the Dennis, in what ways is the legal structure an obstacle? Yeah, I mean, Ian will remember this, that actually you can do weighted voting. So you can have multiple classes of member and do weighted voting if you have an ordinary resolution in, in UK co-op law but not if you've got a special resolution. Of course, the special resolutions are the really important ones, you know, the ones that change the constitution, that wind up a company, that deal with takeovers. So um, we had to find some way to keep all stakeholders enfranchised in a special resolution context. And actually that was easier under company law in the UK than it was under cooperative society law. Um, and and um, that's where international examples, I think, would be good as well, because certainly I know, I think in Belgium, I think uh, Graham knows that in Belgium, this is different. In Italy, it is different. And clearly in Spain, it is different because of, of the, the experience we have of Mondragon. And that would be really good if we could have some guidance uh, uh, on weighted voting in in multi-stakeholder co-ops that could be you know where the conversation could develop across the movement is how to handle that effectively um i'm you know i'm still keen on this principle that you balance you balance interests not just individual individual member voices um, and you need to be able to do that in special resolutions so that's that's my interim feedback yeah, I think on that on that last point, the the, the voting is really interesting in the sense that the, the ICA guidelines made it a, a matter for future consideration. The ILO ICA statistical classifications have introduced the the description of a multi stakeholder co op where you've not got any dominance by particular groups. But the operational guidance in that ILO ICA guidance says. Uh, Co-op should be call, controlled democratically by its members according to the principle that each member has an equal vote, mm -hmm. and that the that that same guidance that sees the members of uh, multi-stakeholder co-ops as being producers, consumers, users, workers, one of the other categories, a combination of those categories. So, if you're talking about equal votes, um, I think society law in the UK, the language it uses on special resolutions is, for instance, 75% of persons who vote must vote in favour or two thirds of people who vote, which in, in one sense is a really clear articulation of it being an association of people and it's votes of people rather than 75% of 
votes cast versus yeah it's, it's of people who vote so th that brings it back to the people centered people focused aspect of a cooperative and you know lots of the literature and, and uh, Rory and others have talked about you know association of people controlling capital rather than capital controlling people etc um uh so it does present a really interesting challenge because what you've also got in the UK, but not everywhere internationally, is a long-standing principle in agricultural co-ops of very different voting, voting based on shares held. But the number of shares held is directly related to your required to purchase that through the number of shares based on your throughput of goods for instance or your supply of milk to the cooperative then weights how many shares you need to buy so in that sense no one challenges it quite rightly there, there, there's some very good examples of cooperatives working under that structure fca guidance specifically recognize the agricultural co-ops ica guidance has all sorts of things have and, and partly it's because that's so wedded to the nature of the business that the the, the, part, the nature of the participation forces it to be cooperative. Uh, it's hard to deviate. I suppose one of my challenges would be to, to multi-stakeholder co-ops is that they can clearly work and they can clearly meet the ICA definition as well as the principles. But on the definition, we talk about members' common economic, social and cultural needs and aspirations. There'll be degrees to which in some multi-stakeholder co-ops there's not enough commonality of interest and in others there is that doesn't mean equal or the same interest but common interests and the the interest might be in the way that a service is delivered might be the commonality with the actual service itself so the ILO uh, talks about the, the the commonality maybe being the way that the service is delivered not just the service um but I think there is a there is a challenge there in balancing that and when you move into the weighted vote and there's a there's a challenge for the ILO for the ICA for others to say well what do we mean by equal voting does equal mean the same or does equal mean weighted and can it mean weighted because that's been long recognized in the principle as well about different arrangements in secondary co-ops and, and and other things so but what does that actually mean i i think the the ilo has noted in other publications the emerging trend on co-op law internationally is towards single pieces of legislation for cooperatives rather than the specificity of different pieces for different types of co-op. That's the trend in the areas where it's developing. But but I think there's a lot of countries with long-standing civil legal traditions where you're unlikely to move away from that. But where you've got emerging co-op legislation, that tends to be looking at the single definition. How do you then create a single definition of a co-op that allows things other than one person, one vote without also then allowing one share one vote uh, you know, because mm -hmm. I, as a registering authority regulator etc i'm often faced with the worst examples of things because no one very rarely do people send through good news stories and go by the way here's something working spectacularly well just thought you'd like to hear it um well, what we tend to get is look at this awful thing that's happened here look at this you know, look what someone's tried to do in changing the share configuration if you look at insolvency law insolvency law creates a default assumption of distribution in accordance with shareholding unless the rules specify otherwise yeah, that's not consistent with being a cooperative generally. So th there are these challenges to say, how do you create, if you want one definition, given that the co-op community internationally hasn't resolved it, what exactly do you want to see in legislation that facilitates deviation from one member, one person or one vote in terms of equality of vote and allows for that weighting that's in the ILO classification? And that also applies to the, the, the what you talk about, the investor members. That is a challenge. Co-ops need money to do things. Um, how do you get that money? You can either do it through debt, but then you might have obligations, contractual obligations. You might have covenants in place. You might have other things. You can do it through capital and risk capital. How do you, how do you raise it? So it is, a, it is a really difficult thing to balance, but that's always been the case. And that goes to things like autonomy and independence. You know, how heavily debt laden do you want to be versus how much risk capital and what interest? And, you know, I mean, option it's easy, but those things have to be carefully managed. And just the, the other thing, we've talked about legal structures, I think the UK Society for Co-op Studies hosted an interesting lecture a few weeks ago, um, at a more sort of jurisprudential basis, looking at the impact of incorporation on one's nature as a cooperative. Um, they're not necessarily views that I, I, I share, but it's really interesting listening to. So actually, when you're looking at autonomy and independence, when you're looking at how much involvement of the, with the state – 
do cooperatives want? Because the more you ask for, the more the involvement is. The more you want the tax incentives or the different treatment, you, know, you could not have limited liability. You could not have bought buddy corporate status and then have very limited interaction, not have to register depending on your size. You might hit certain barriers if you've got too many members on that basis with other laws. But there, there is that challenge there as well about how do you balance all of those things together in a cooperative structure? Okay. Uh, on this, if, if I may, and, and also to, to, to reply to Rory's comment about what happens in other countries. In Italy, there has been a, a lot of talk around uh, finanza sociale d'impatto, which I guess is translated with social impact finance, and how that uh, can, make, can, can be made consistent with third sector organizations. And in fact, Although uh, there is, um, as in other countries, a profit distribution constraint, of course, uh, uh, there is a, a, a big um, uh, concern about uh, how the introduction of the, these tools can actually impact on the intrinsic motivation that um, characterizes this type of organizations. And so the question is whether uh, Capital in, new capital inflows from investors can actually uh, compromise uh, the, the, the social economy, uh, which uh, which has its own its own rules. And, and and these concerns actually are especially expressed by third sector organisations, which do not do not actually make use of, uh, of of social impact finance tools. So basically, on the demand side. There is no use of of, of this type of, um, of 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 resources, uh, so they they keep on using traditional ways of funding themselves, uh, which is mostly with uh, resources generated endogenously or uh, just borrowing borrowing with banks, uh, so mortgages essentially. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I guess there's also an issue, as Ian was saying, around um, uh, the fact that most of these organizations in the social economy are social cooperatives. And so the rule that one had one vote is still uh, in place. And, and that might also be not very attractive for, for, for some, some investors. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I'm conscious that we probably want to take a short comfort break, but is there anybody who just wants to come back on the points that we've made? Okay. Um, I've only got one last comment, which is I like the idea of layering one person, one vote on top of one interest, one vote, if, if you if like. So within the member groups, it's one person, one vote. But effectively, each stakeholder group has one vote in a special resolution situation. And you need, you know, three of your stake. Well, you need all four of your stakeholder groups, in fact, in, in most cases, in a fair shares to pass a special resolution. But you could say that you need three of the four. Um, I'm not I'm not keen on that myself, but some people would would live with that. Um, but I think we have to thank you for your participation. We, we hope you'll stick around for the second half. We're hoping not only to have Steve Gill, but Dave Boyle from Community Shares uh, speaking on, on financial incentives. So keeping our fingers crossed that he'll turn up in the next five minutes. All right. So uh, make yourself a coffee and we'll kick off again at uh, 3.30 or 3.35. Let's say it's 3.35. Thanks, Sylvia. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. I'm going to pause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.